experts in emotion interview. Uh, we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Marianne LaFrance to consider the question of whether men and women emotionally differ. So Dr. LaFrance is a professor of psychology and of women and gender studies at Yale University where she teaches courses in social psychology and gender psychology, as well as nonverbal communication. So her research focuses on how emotion and power are transmitted in these subtle emotional communication cues. Some of her recent work has focused in particular on the human smile, examining questions such as why do when, uh, men smile less than women? Why do women smile when being sexually harassed? And to whom do babies show a coy smile? Um, this work has received widespread attention in various media outlets, including NPR, BBC, NBC, The New York Times, among many others. So I will now turn to an interview with my local Yale colleague, uh, Dr. Marianne LaFrance. One of the things I'd love to speak with you about as we get started is what first kind of captured your interest in emotion in the first place? Kind of where did it all begin for you? Well, I think if I can go right back to the beginning, one of the things mm -hmm. that I remember my mother saying to me and my sibs, which is pay attention to how people say things, maybe even more than what they're actually saying. So facial expression, eye contact, gesture. So she said it matters how th things are said. And that was a really intriguing notion, which is if it's how, then it means that it's not verbal. And if it's not verbal, then it must be nonverbal. And the what becomes, what is it that they're c really communicating? And that's emotion. So that's, I think, the, the core roots. That's so fascinating, because many of what captures our attention in emotion are our own early experiences and observations. Absolutely. I, in fact, dedicated my dissertation to my mom, who, and I said to my mom, whose ability to tell what was going on between people was the wonder of my childhood. Hmm. That's wonderful. So that sparked your interest in emotion, and so I'd love to ask you a few questions now about the many things you've done, you know, since then, um, you know, in trying to understand emotion, gender, and we'll talk about the smile as well. Um, so some people believe that, you know, men and women are profoundly different. You know, we've heard that they might even be from different planets. And I guess the question I have for you is, is this really true in terms of, are men and women really from different, you know, emotional planets? Um, do we see evidence to suggest that might be the case? I'm going to do the academic thing and say yes and no, <laughs> but mostly no. That is, it is clear that there's a profound belief that men and women, girls and boys, are different. And the assumption usually is that it is something essential, that the differences are not learned, that the differences are not layered over, but in fact come at core from our genetics. It is true that there are some differences. We clearly have different organs and uh, different bodies. But most of what makes us male or female, masculine or feminine, comes much later. We acquire it, we learn it, we specialize in it, we become experts in it. And the thing that's so interesting, actually, is if you take little kids and you say, what is your, if you say to a little boy, what does your mommy look like? You say to a little girl, what does your daddy look like? They posturally and expressively will do it. It will be recognizably gendered. So the very nature of how we sit, how frequently we, or how quickly we blink, um, Many of these things we acquire by virtue of observation and instruction and learning. I mean, so it sounds like from what you're saying, it's not so much that men and women are born different emotionally, but it, that it's something over time they learn and they're almost socialized in ways to maybe show emotions differently or maybe even talk about emotions differently. Absolutely. And I think it's all of those things. That is, whatever emotion is, it's multi layered. It is multi-component. So we talk about expressivity, talk about subjectivity, talk about physiological, talk about brain kinds of mm -hmm. things. And at every component that we study, gender is more or less large or small and then more or less variable across situation. So to say that women are more emotional than men, true in the sense of either self-report, so you get 
uh, women, are you emotional? Yes, women say they are more emotional. Mm -hmm. But if you do online kind of coding, that is you ask, at this very second, what are you feeling and how intensely are you feeling it, then the gender differences in emotion tend to dissipate. Oh, that's fascinating. So what do you think then, as we try to understand gender and emotion moving forward, what do you think are some of the most, I don't know, challenging puzzles we're going to face as we try to really tease apart the ways in which men and women are similar or are different? There are a lot of interesting questions. Yeah. A lot of data um, has been collected, but we still don't know a lot about under what circumstances mm -hmm. are women more emotional than men, and is it more expressive than um, subjective. That is, if we measure only gender differences in, say, physiology, there's not much there that suggests that there are profound differences. But if you ask men and women, if you watch men and women, women are much more expressive with their faces, with their voices, with their gestures. It is part of women to be expressive, to be communicative, to, if you will, reach out, and part of masculinity, at least in our culture, is to damp it down, keep it under wraps, be stoic. stoic. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So interesting. So one of the things that you've also looked at that's relevant to this is, you know, the human smile, you know, and that's something that we're all really interested in, sort of why do we smile, you know, who do we smile to, what are the rules that govern different kinds of smiles, and you wrote uh, a really compelling book, um, Lip Service, talking a bit more about this, and I just wonder if you could share some of the observations um, that you detailed in this book as to on why do we smile, and is this something that can also help us better understand gender differences in emotion by just looking at something as simple as the smile? Smiling is fascinating for several reasons. One is there is not a culture or a area or a historical period in which smiling has not been found. Mm -hmm. So babies come to birth smiling. In fact, we know from studies of babies in the womb, actually in latter stage trimester, babies are smiling. Now, they're not smiling because they're having a grand old time. Well, they might be, but we don't know <laughs> that yet. What happens then is layers of socialization, layers of culture, layers of exposure to different contexts and different social roles. So everybody smiles, but then the question becomes, who smiles more under what circumstances? We do know across many, many, many studies that women reliably smile more than men, mm -hmm. but those differences are very, very much a function of what age, for example, you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The largest sex difference in smiling, with women smiling more than men, occurs between the ages of about 17 and 23. Huh. After that, the differences basically disappear so that by middle age there are not really profound sex differences. Mm -hmm. There are also really substantial within sex variations. So some men smile more than other men, some women smile less than other women, yeah. and that variability is really quite substantial. Smiling appears to be in part a signal of underlying positive affect, but smiling is a lot more than that. Smiling, in fact, is the all-purpose mask. When people are feeling anything but happy, they often will smile. So it covers, it allows people to regain their composure, if you will. It holds people off. It deflects too much attention. So smiling is, I've sometimes referred to it as a Swiss army knife of interpersonal relationships. Mm -hmm. It is multiply useful. It can establish connection. It can stand as an apology. It can suggest that one is willing to cooperate. It can indicate allegiances. So people who smile at each other across the proverbial crowded room are saying, gotcha, see you, we're in this, we're special. Um, so that there are many social functions that smiling serves besides being a readout of underlying positive emotion. That's so interesting. I mean, it makes smiling t you know, to be this complex, multifaceted thing that happens just in a blink of an eye, but that in ways is just, you know, subtly navigating our everyday social exchanges. Absolutely. Navigating, I think, is a terrific way to characterize it because we smile at strangers. 
not a lot, but smiling is one of the facial expressions that tends to be reciprocated by strangers. If I frown at you and we don't know each other and we're passing each other on the street, you're not likely to frown back at me. But if I smile at you, there may be a very quick recognition and, mm -hmm. and doing it likewise. So that it, it gets us through a lot of social situations where words would take too much time, too complicated, too ambiguous. Smiling smooths things out, lets us go through without a lot of tension or conflict or ambiguity. And do you think that there are certain kinds of smiles that may be, I don't know, more socially effective than other smiles? Or it's a, it's a yeah. actually a great question, and I think that's where the research is going. One of the distinctions that researchers have made, which I think has some terrific validity, is the distinction between what is called the Duchenne, after a French physiologist, um, the Duchenne smile, which is apparently the really legitimate sign of genuine, spontaneous, positive emotion. And two facial features are involved with the genuine smile. Mm -hmm. That's the mouth, and mm -hmm. but it also involves the eyes. It's actually a muscle the circumference is the eye socket, which squeezes, so it causes the eye to close a little bit. Mm -hmm. It raises, there's a little pouching of the lower lid. There's mm -hmm. a little crinkling of the outer eyes. There's a little lowering of the upper lid on the outside. That is hard to do deliberately. This, that is the mouth, is really easy. We all learn how to do that. All mm -hmm. someone has to do is aim a camera at us and say, smile, we know what to do. We may think it's, it's awkward and it's silly and it's inauthentic. So there are genuine smiles, but there are many other kinds of smiles. Smiles that have often, say, if I'm trying to mask negative affect, say I'm feeling actually really sad at the moment. And I, I don't want to impose that on you. I don't want it, you to know. I don't want to express it. So my mouth may say, happy, happy, smile, smile. Mm -hmm. But if I look at the, at the inner brows, I see maybe some tension, I see some other action. So there are smiles like that. Smiles also that come on the face really fast and go off really fast. Often you can see this in people who are in public and they don't think they're being observed, but then they, somebody, they catch somebody's eye and the smile comes on and the people go away, smile drops off. So the timing of a smile mm -hmm. distinguishes between a genuine and a non-genuine smile. There are also smiles that are purely to convey a sense of, let's get through this, let's just move along, let's smooth things out. And that smile, everybody knows to be polite or social, but it's not about emotion, or at least it's not about a readout of what's really going on inside. It's almost like a social regulator in a way. It is absolutely that. Interesting. One of the things you said that I thought was interesting linking smiling to gender differences is that there seems to be this critical period where men and women do differ in smiling, but then after that period, I think you said it was 17 to 23, mm -hmm. it, it disappears. What do we think is going on? Uh, why do we start smiling? It's, it's converging in our smiles, I guess. It's a terrific question. Yeah. I th w there are those of an evolutionary psychology band who would say, when mating is most critical, the sexes should be the most different so that there's no confusion about who you're going mm -hmm. to engage with. Others suggest that that's when the social pressure is at its maximum to indicate that one is appropriately masculine and feminine. And there is no better way to indicate femininity than smiling. And in fact, it's at that age that young men who smile especially if they are seen as smiling too much, the too much means there's something odd about their masculinity. So mm -hmm. we question their inherent masculinity if there's too much smiling. It also appears to be the case that that's when gender roles in terms of occupations, in terms of vocations, in terms of preferences, gender roles really are really quite paramount. And there are a lot of occupations and jobs and roles that are really gendered still. That is, women tend to be more caregivers. They tend to be more in public relations kinds of occupations, which require a lot of smiling. So we know, for example, if you put men in those same occupations, lo and behold, their smiling rates go up. Mm -hmm. If you put women in more traditional masculine occupations, lo and behold, their smiling drops off. So it's less maybe at certain ages than a, the, about gender than it is about the separation into mm -hmm. social roles that are related to gender. Yeah, it sounds really like it's all about social context. 
Social context matters a lot. Smiling is probably the most variable facial expression. I think when we look at expressions associated with anger, distress, uh, disgust, sadness, and the like, I think then the expressions are often more authentic readouts of what the underlying affect is. Smiling is the great question mark. In fact, Darwin, when he talked about facial expressions, was a little mystified with smiling because it didn't appear to be functionally adaptive. It didn't appear to arrive from some bodily or some core notion of survival. So what it is is actually a, still a bit of a mystery. So interesting. Um, I want to ask you a little bit further. I mean, a lot of your work, too, has looked more broadly at other kinds of nonverbal communication, the smile being, being one of them, and just how these subtle communication uh, pieces of information can actually communicate really important information about things like social power, which seems really, really profound. I mean, how is it that we can convey things about our gender identity, you know, personal allegiances, simply through... Uh, these nonverbal acts, or in other words, without saying a single word? Nonverbal communication is something that humans need because it is simple, it's efficient, it is, if you will, off the mm -hmm. record. So if you say something to me of a unkind sort, I can say, June, what was that about? Why, why did you say that? But if you do a little kind of scowl at me, if you bodily turn away from me, if you indicate by certain other kinds of cues, vocal tone, that you're really disinterested, I can't say, uh, hey, what was that tone of voice thing? It's, it would sound maybe bordering on the paranoid. It would sound kind of bizarre. Unless you're a psychologist. Unless perhaps. you're a psychologist, <laughs> in which we do it all the time. Then. Um, yeah. So nonverbal communication is a multi-layered way of establishing relationships, of indicating, you've mentioned power, who's on top and who's not, mm -hmm. um, who's striving to move up, who's worried about moving down. So smiling, another uh, example. There is some data, there is some controversy on this, but there's some data that mm -hmm. suggests that the lower power person, person with less standing, less status in a relationship, is the one who smiles more. Okay. And the higher power person theoretically smiles less. Now, what we find in our research is it's a little bit more complicated, but it can come down in some sense to the following. Lower power people may smile more because they have to. In fact, we find that lower power people say they smile when they do because of the need to please. They don't want to offend. They don't want people to think ill of them. Higher po power people tend to smile when they feel like smiling and don't smile when they don't feel like it because they don't have to. Hmm. They don't have to sort of show affiliation. Exactly. They don't have to be a, be pleasant. They don't have to, because they've got the standing, they've got the status, and other people need to rise to them rather than they need to um, somehow or other be compliant or um, deferential or submissive. That's not part of the high power role often. Right. I'm sure people in their everyday lives can imagine situations like job interviews where they're finding that they may be smiling much more frequently than they normally would, for example, um, you know, to sort of please the higher power person. But that's yeah. often some of a double-edged sword. So yeah. interviewees are often told, smile, make eye contact, smile, mm -hmm. indicate you're engaged by smiling. Mm -hmm. But often the smiling then heads into too much. So often what comes across is this sort of greeningness, and you know sometimes mm -hmm. in those positions, I'm smiling too much, I've got to stop, but I can't because, you know, there, there I am with, with my smile. Mm -hmm. So smiling too much happens fairly quickly. That is to say that one can smile too much without meaning to or wanting to, and it can then take the evaluation of the person from competent and socially adept mm -hmm. into, why are they grinning like that when we're talking about these serious matters? So it can be almost too much of a good thing. Absolutely. In fact, we find, especially in studies of women interviewees and men interviewees, women smile a lot, a lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. And they are seen often as warm and pleasant and altogether really nice people. But then too much smiling sometimes is correlated with too little competence. Mm. So if a person smiles too much, they go overboard in one thing which suggests that maybe that other dimension of being smart and competent and really intellectually skilled 
some questions can be raised. Right, so it brings their sort of social power down even more. Exactly. Fascinating. So, I mean, this has been really great to talk about all your work on, you know, nonverbal cues, smiling, gender and emotion. And so when you think about all the work you've done and sort of the puzzles that remain, where do you see the face of the future going in emotion? Oh, wow, what a question. <laughs> I think the thing that's wonderful yeah. about emotion and emotion mm -hmm. research is that there are so many directions. So we talk about, we haven't talked today about it, but huge differences culturally, which raises a lot of basic questions about is emotion universal? Is it something that we all share? Well, yes, but if we say look at cross-cultural differences in emotion, the rules for how much one expresses, under what circumstances, what emotions are fostered, what emotions are encouraged to be damped down, to go away, issues about where in these massive brains that we have are emotions mm -hmm. located. It's likely to be multiply located. The, one of the questions about emotion, I think, has to do with, in some sense, what is it? I mean, we assume we know. It's, everybody knows what emotion is, but I think what researchers are finding is it is a really complex phenomenon in its own right. And as we proceed into the broader social world, culture, uh, nation, his history, we will also be proceeding in a more micro level into the brain, and there's so many questions to ask and ans have answered about those connections. I mean, it feels almost like, with what you're saying, the face of the future is also what got us started in emotion in the first place, kind of questioning the core, you know, I don't know, bottom, bottom up issue of what, what is emotion, you know, in the first place. It is a really interesting question, yeah. and lots of work still remains to be done. So in terms of lots of work, I mean, some of it, you know, we'll all try to do in our generation, but a lot of it, too, will remain for future scholars and students of emotion to try Absolutely. to. Absolutely. I think it's the one of those areas in which we've come up with a lot of interesting data, some really interesting findings, but the questions are as extensive as they ever were. So what advice would you have for students who are just embarking in the study of emotion or maybe thinking about dabbling with it? What might you say to them? Well, maybe you'd start with an emotion that mystifies you, um, makes you angry, makes you sad, uh, gets under your skin. Start with some behavior that you've noticed in yourself, say blushing, for mm -hmm. example. We know very little bit about blushing, which is related to emotion. If you come from some other part of the, of the world, of the rural, urban, um, west, east, south, north, um, you, you name the location of your origin, you may be fascinated with it seems to work different here than it does mm -hmm. in some other kind of place. So start with something that is interesting, aggravating, fascinating, something that says, I need to know more about this, really. Mm, that's a great, that's a great place to end. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Marian. Great. This concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Marian LaFrance from Yale University. Thank you again for speaking with us.